Robert Williams from the University of uh, Arizona. Many of you were here for that. I want to uh, just say he did a great job. We have those meetings recorded, and we're going to release this after uh, Dr. Wilkins uh, uh, speaking here today. I want to thank the Charles Council members for being here. That's critical because to do anything with enrollment and requires an ordinance, and that ordinance has to be between the administration and the legislative arm. So uh, tribal council has to be involved. And all the, the more information we can get, the more better, the better we're going to be as far as addressing the issue. We are live streaming this today, and we're proud to do that. But um, let me just go ahead and say that uh, Dr. David Wilkins is a personal friend of mine. We grew up together. Uh, since we were kids, we played baseball together. And right here on this campus, we had an all-Indian softball team back in the mid-70s. And then, intramural sports were big here. And softball was really huge. And we went undefeated and beat every fraternity on campus. <laughs> I said, one of them. And I actually saw outfielders and when we hit the championship game, just you can hit a baseball, uh, softball so far. It, it just thundered gloves down in disgust and just give up and win the game and just have to do that. So. But more importantly than that, uh, we actually uh, were in our first sweat lodge together with others, Pearl Dahl and others, back in the 70s when I think we were 19 years old. And I've never told this story before, but I'll tell you now. In our first sweat lodge, I, you know, we really didn't know what to expect. We were all searching for um, who we were, just like we are now, uh, as our our true Indianness inside of ourselves, our spiritual Indianness, and uh, what it meant to us personally, but collaboratively. But when we were sitting in that first sweat lodge down by the Lumber River, uh, it was intense, and it was heavy prayer, and it was just so uh, engulfing spiritually and mentally and physically, and demanding as well. But all I could hear was this loud flapping, fluttering in my ears. I mean, too, it got, almost got the word. I was just, what is this? And um, I remember that something came down and grabbed me on my shoulder like that. And that's the first closeness I ever, an awakening I ever had with a red tail hawk. Because that's what it meant to me coming out of that sweat box. I don't think I've even ever told you that. So, this is a man I have a close relationship with. I have a lot of confidence in him, and I'm sure you will too after, after he starts his discussions. Dr. David Wilkins is a citizen of the Lummi Nation and holds the McKnight Presidential Professorship in American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. He has adjunct appointments in political science, law, and American studies. He earned his PhD in political science Sorry to say this, at the University of North Carolina Chapel, I know there's some Duke fans in here. <laughs> in December 1990, he is the author of, or editor of a number of books, including Red Prophet, The Punishing Intellectualism of Vine Deloria Jr., Dismembered, Native Dis Disenrollment in the Battle for Basic Human Rights, All of Justice, Indigenous Claims Against the U.S., The Navajo Political Experience, The Hank Adam's Reader, The Legal Universe, Documents of Native American Political Development. His articles have appeared, appeared in a range of social <coughs> science, law, history, and ethics studies journal. And on the last note, he is a protege of Blind and Ray Jr. Let's welcome Dr. David Wilkins. Live our own. Good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's really an honor to be to be back home. Um, and I thank Chairman Gardner for, for his good words. I'm glad I've got some of my relatives here, my cousins, my wife is right here. Um, and Danny Bell, and I know quite a few of you. Um, for those of you I don't know, I hope to get to know you. Um, this is really an incredibly important issue, as the chairman noted. It's a subject I've been studying uh, since the 1990s, when one of my best friends, Monica from Virginia, had been disenrolled from his tribe. Um, and the same year, the federal court um, banished five, or Tonawana banished, Seneca banished five members of their tribe for having committed treason. 
So that put it in my head to keep an eye on this issue. And my glory always said, when you see something happening more than two or three times in short order, that means there's a trend developing. And I didn't like what that trend was, what, what was developing. Um, but coming home on the 50th anniversary of the lovely homecoming really is fascinating. It tells me I'm really getting old now. Uh, we retired in 1968, my dad, from Fort, I mean, Fort Richardson, Alaska. We moved back in August with the death of that year. I mean, we went out to the rec center for Big Dennis. I've been trying to take down some young ladies. I wasn't successful that first time, but um, it was a great, uh, a great experience to be back home and learn how to swim in the, in the Lumbee River um, and just to be back home among uh, my relatives. So I don't want to take too much time uh, this afternoon, uh, despite the important nature of this, uh, this issue. So I know I can't really compete with Little Miss Lundy, which starts at 6.30, and I know quite a few of you who can't go through that. Um, but I want to take my time and really lay out for you as clearly as I can why I think it's such a crucial uh, issue. My wife, Shelly, has prepared PowerPoint. I've never used PowerPoint in my life, so this is going to be the first time for us. We wrote a book together on this issue, but she convinced me that seeing things visually would be a help to you all. Um, and so while I talk, she's going to be flashing things up there. So check it out because it really amplifies what I'm going to be saying in my prepared remarks. Um, so we're going to see how, this, see how this plays out. And I hope we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Because this really is a crucial issue. How do we define who we are as lumpy people? Right? That's, there's nothing more crucial than that. And again, I thank Chairman Godwin, um, who realized early on the importance of this topic. Um, Frida Porter for reaching out to me initially. And Danielle McLean and Rena Oxendine, um, who have been carrying the heavy burden of trying to deal with this issue internally. After conversations with Chairman Godwin and Frida Porter, I was asked to cover four main points, which I'm going to try to get through today within the time allotted. The first thing is this broad overview talk that... I've given it several times because the book that my wife and I wrote dismembered because this is a phenomenon that's not just happening here, it's happening across the country. At least 80 nations, and you have the chart I think, right? Mm -hmm. Identifying 80 native peoples that are kicking out, that are stripping citizenship from their relatives. Uh, this is something that we never did historically, folks. We didn't do this until uh, the early 1990s when gambling revenue for many tribes and when crime in many tribes both erupted simultaneously. Um, and that um, are the two major precipitating events that have propelled many tribes to do it, but other tribes do it for different reasons, some of which I'll be talking about today. So after the general talk, which might take 25 minutes or so, which lays out the broad background on a national scale, and I'll insert um, our, some of our own uh, tribal uh, uh, situations within that, then the second part, I want to talk about how do other Native nations determine who belongs to their communities. Right? How do other nations de determine citizenship or membership? Then part three, how do other nations decide and why do they decide to disenroll or to cast out uh, their members? What are the grounds on which that uh, takes place? And some of those grounds are laid out in the table that you have. And then fourth, I want to give some examples of at least five tribes that have very strong language in their constitution or their organic document in which they say, we don't have the power to tell someone they're not a Lumbee, they're not a Yakima, they're not a Duck Valley Shoshone. Right? And historically, that was the attitude that all Native peoples had. Because you are birth, your birthright is your birthright from birth until death. <coughs> and then finally, and most importantly, we prepared, my wife and I, a set of recommendations and they're complicated, they're dense, but we're going to put them up here, and we're going to leave copies uh, with, with the nation, and we lay them out for you, uh, and we pray that you will consider them earnestly and give them a lot of thought, um, because this is a topic that will be a defining feature of how, and, and it will determine how we move forward uh, as a nation. Um, so, after all that's done, it's going to be time to go have a swim at the rec center and then go to Fuller's and have some barbecue. And that's my plan for the, for the evening. <laughs> so, the question, who's your people, right? That is a fundamentally lumpy expression that we all know, right? 
It's a powerful question that has always linked us together as a community. It's a question that every native nation, in one form or another, asks their citizens and their people as well. What does it mean to be Lumbee, Kohari, Shinnecock, Hopi, Lakota, or Meharan? is arguably the most important discussion we can have. What are the defining characteristics that make an indigenous nation just that? Indigenous and a nation, right? Well, we're both of those things. We are a nation by definition. We have our own government, we have our own land, we have our own language, we have our own values. That's what a nation is. That's a pretty powerful concept. And related to that, what is required of each individual to be considered a bona fide member or citizen? of uh, that nation. And once we started to define who we are, we are also inevitably faced with the question of who we are not. Right? And that's what a lot of what we're going to talk about today uh, centers around. Historically, our lands, our waters, our languages, our kinship system, and spiritual values and traditions provided the framework that we relied upon. The bonds of our organic connections to one another and our land were so strong that our people never had any identity crises, either national or individual. So in 1868 or 1968, when one Lumbee met another Lumbee, whether we were called Croatan or Suan or whatever, we were all Lumbee. Whether we met in Kurt Locklear's hardware store or at Linda's for breakfast, or at the or at the Hardee's, which is no longer there. I just I just noticed, by the way. Um, or the Baltimore Indian Center, or in Detroit. And once they exchanged their genealogical information with one another, their world of relatives had expanded by one. Right? Mm -hmm. You had just met another lump, and you were proud to know that person, and that felt good, especially if you were in a foreign city, right? Detroit's a foreign city to me, but you know, but it felt good to meet another alum, wherever you were. We didn't ask that new relative if they had maintained contact with the community, if they could name local officials, identify Lumby churches, list Lumby schools, or identify Lumby leaders. That was no business of ours. We were simply happy to have identified another alum, who, as it frequently turns out, we were probably related to, right? I met Ryan Emanuel just a month ago in, in, at a conference in Washington State. And we got to talking. I said, who's your people? And he told me. And he said, well, who's yours? And I told him, he said, we're second cousins. <laughs> I said, who? Well, right? But that's how it happens among our people. But since the early 1980s, when we began driving hard for federal, full and complete federal recognition, after dwelling in the gray area of partial recognition since the 1950s, we felt the need to somehow prove that we're a real nation. Because of this insecurity, we veered into territory that is taking us farther away from the kinship relations that once held us so close together. But we're not alone in this, of course. Many groups seeking federal recognition also feel compelled to act in ways contrary to their essential character in their pursuit of federal recognition. But in all of our research involving the 570 federally recognized tribal nations, we're not aware of any other native nation that has a system like ours, which focuses on how to identify who is not a relative, weeding out blood kin with a cultural test that is less informative and useful than what the state requires for a driver's license. And that demands that we and that demands that we recertify our enrollment every seven years. This makes us, um, this makes no sense, uh, or this makes sense for certain purposes, uh, if you're applying for social services programs or for citizenship in another nation, but my understanding is that once you're alum, you're always alum, right? That didn't require recertification. Uh, you're born and you are. Our Constitution requires that we somehow look into our citizens or potential citizens' hearts and minds to determine if they are truly Lumbee, no matter who they're related to. That is a judgment that no human being should be forced to undergo or that another one should be forced to make. Our government spends precious time, staff, and resource, resources 
certifying or recertifying this unanswerable question. I learned recently that this happens 3,300 times a year. Imagine how much money and resources put into deciding who is still a lumpy, right? That money could be used for other important things, right? Like historic preservation or some kind of other program dealing with the environment. Funds are used for DNA testing, record research, and interview time. And that takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. And no tribal nation has unlimited resources. From a citizen point of view, we spend money to travel back for recertification, time off work, and hours of anxiety over proving we belong. Imagine if you had to re-up your U.S. citizenship every seven years, right? Or your North Carolina state citizenship every seven years, right? We don't think about that. Well, we're not required to do that, right? To maintain that. It's just assumed that if you're born a U.S. citizen, you're always a U.S. citizen. You're born in North Carolina and you remain resident in North Carolina, you're always a North Carolina state citizen. And historically, we understood that about our own people, didn't we? Absolutely. All of this time and money used leads to many members being made outcasts, and it makes people feel culturally inferior. The staff members who are required to put these policies into practice have to deal with the trauma and responsibility of making impossible subjective decisions. He was an 18-year-old boy from Detroit, born of Lumbee parents who couldn't afford to make it back to Robinson County every year. Really a Lumbee, if he knows his grandmother grew up at Burnt Swamp, but can't remember which church or which school she attended? That makes no sense. Not to me. Those put through this testing process, even if they pass, are left with feelings of humiliation and ill will towards their own nation. That's not good. One of my second cousins who lives in Raleigh just last year was disenrolled, told he was no longer a lump, despite his father having a father who was a lineal descendant of a bona fide lumby. His grandmother sitting right here, my Aunt Faye. And when I learned about that, I put on the paint. And I began to talk to tribal officials. And we got that overturned right quickly, right? Because it wasn't right. Why would they want to be part of a community that works so hard to keep them out? We have young people eager to know their kinfolk and their heritage shut out, their talent and enthusiasm lost to us. Even if they become citizens, we have taught them that their citizenship means little more than being a member of a country club or a fraternity or a sorority, subject to cancellation if they can't pass the test. But let us imagine, let us imagine the infinite possibilities of indigenous political, social, and cultural development if our nation and people did not spend so much time, money, and resources pursuing recognition and identity. When people constantly feel that they must measure up to someone else's ideas that are contrary to their own understanding of who they are and how they came to be, devastating psychic and emotional confusion results. We start worrying about who we are and whether or not our community is tribal, or worse, if we ourselves are Indian enough. Vine Deloria, the leading architect of the Native Sovereignty Movement that we all benefit from, and a good friend of our people, wrote an article in 1974 in which he said, the gut question has to do with the meaning of the tribe. Should it continue to be a political entity should it become primarily an economic structure, or should it become once again a spiritual community? The future, he said, perhaps the immediate future will tell. This was in 1974 when he made that statement. And we have to take this bull by the horns, folks, and address it. By spiritual bind meant our essential kinship and community connections, our sense of belonging together as a people. This is an incredibly important concept that our people understood well historically and must think about always. The right to belong to and rest assured of one's integral place, both psychically and organically, in the Lumbee Nation is vital. But we are not unique in our struggle. Tribal belonging, long viewed as an absolute given by bona fide Native citizens, since the early 1990s has in many cases become essentially a political privilege, decided and changed by whomever is in power, 
in an ever-increasing number of indigenous communities. And since the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Santa Clara versus Martinez in 1978, which affirmed a federally recognized tribal nation's right to be the ultimate decider of who belongs in their nation, an expanding list of native peoples, 30 tribes in California alone, are kicking out, are stripping citizenship of their, from their members. And it's happening in at least 50 other native communities in 20 other states. So at least 80 native peoples are doing what we are also doing. And they are stripping their those citizens of their rights. It breaks my heart to see how my own nation sometimes mimics these other nations' disastrous policies. In fact, our nation has disenrolled more citizens than every other tribal nation except one. Uh, there's a tribe in California called the Chichansi, and Shelley and I interviewed uh, several of their members for our book. They've, been, they've disenrolled over 1,000 of their citizens. The tribe only had 1,600 members to begin with. Right? Over 1,000. Guess how many Lumbees have been decertified, largely because they could not maintain contact since the tribe began to do this? Over 500. We've cast out 500 Lumbees who were members of the nation. We're the second largest uh, in the country. I just learned this last week. I'd be trying to get this information, and when I got it, it just broke my heart. I said, we've got to be better than this, folks. In at least five of the nations that are doing this, including the Grand Ronde of Oregon, and the Saginaw Chippewa of, of, of Wisconsin, they've gone so far as to disenroll dead people. Dead people. So they could then legally terminate living tribal members who descend from those people. At least five of our nations do that. Historically, we revered the dead, didn't we? And yet some of our own indigenous relatives from other tribes are casting out even deceased members. In one case involving the Redding Rancheria, uh, another family that we also interviewed for our book, the great-grandmother great -grandmother of Carla Foreman, the daughter of Bob Foreman, the tribe's first modern tribal chairman, was exhumed, dug up, and DNA tested. And even though the test confirmed that the descendants were directly related, they were still disenrolled. When Carla broke down during our interview and cried, telling us this, over the idea of having had her grand, great grandmother dug up, a tribal councilwoman told her, What does she care? She's just a bag of bones. So when Native people start talking like that, we've crossed the line, right? Yes. That's a line we should never be even nearing, folks. We know that. We know that. The Lumbee have not gone so far as to disenroll, disown our dead, but we are pretty good at kicking out living relatives. If a Lumbee lived off territory, was adopted out, or grew up in a family that kept it themselves, someone they've never met can decide maybe they don't know enough about being Lumbee to be a Lumbee, so they can be cast out. They can be told they no longer belong. Even though their parents and all their ancestors have been Lumbee. Right? This happens far too often, and we all have kinfolk who have been stripped of their citizenship. Not because they have, don't have the required descendancy, but because they don't know the name of a tribal politician, or the name of a school, or the name of a Lumbee church. We have also, unfortunately, incorporated the outdated and unscientific measure known as blood quantum in our tribal ordinance, a zero-sum game that more than 70% of tribal nations also still rely upon. Despite the fact that the blood that flows in our veins does nothing more than keep us alive. Right? That's what blood does. It keeps us alive, right? Our ordinance states that, quote, all persons enumerated as Indian on tribal-based rolls shall be deemed for forced Lundy Indian blood, end of quote. But why do we put that in our tribal ordinance? Right? How many of our ancestors on those base rolls in 1900 or 1910 were full-blooded? Who knows that? Did anybody definitively convince me that they know who that is? You can't do that. We can't do that on any level. <laughs> Our identity historically was not about whether we were full-bloods, half-bloods, or mixed-bloods. 
Our kinship connections mattered, whether that was done by, by our family lines, through marriage, or through adoption. Right? That's how all Native peoples grew and, 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 and moved forward. This is a book on blood quantum that just came out um, last six months or so ago, called The Great Banshee Act, Blood Quantum and the Politics of Native Nations. I encourage you to pick it up. There's some good essays in here written by a lot of different Native people that will help educate um, all of us about what um, this blood quantum is, is doing to our nations. Genetic purity has never existed for any human community, uh, ladies and gentlemen, since no nation was genetically pure now or any time in the historical past. Who in this room or anywhere can identify the first full-blood Lumbee? Right? I don't know who could do that. We simply don't know, nor does any other nation, Native nation, know that. Right? Nobody does. A good thing, and that's why in this book, I encourage you to check it out. The people making these judgments are just doing their job according to the rules that they've been given. And we can't blame them in the enrollment office. We can't, and we shouldn't. What we can blame is a federal system set up to devalue our family ties, making where we went to school or how often our parents could afford to get us back home to lovely territory more important than our living relatives. This power to denationalize members or citizens of their own nations by forcing them out is having devastating consequences for those excluded and is adversely impacting the integrity of our nations. Engaging in such horrific tactics may prove detrimental to all natives if the federal government decides to step in by congressional action or the official <coughs> opinion, which they did regularly in the 1800s and 1900s, and tell us who belongs to our, to our community, right? They did that all the time uh, among a number of Western tribes. And we talk about all that research in our book. We also experienced that in the 1930s when Washington sent the anthropologist Carl Seltzer down here to take pictures and measure our heads, see if we had bad hair, right? And check the width of our noses. Is that up there? Yeah, there it is. That's my grandpa up there in the upper right. right? Dunny Hugh Wilkins. Huh? He was one of the folks. There it is. Grandpa Wilkins. Yeah. I don't know who that lucky is right here. I'm not, I'm not sure who he belongs to. Carl Selsa comes down here to try and decide whether or not those 222 Lumbees had more than one half Indian blood and could be receive federal benefits and federal services. And many of you have seen uh, some of these pictures, right? Uh, my grandpa, Donahue Wilkins, uh, was part of that farce. He was first told that he did not have one half native blood and therefore was not an Indian for federal purposes. But then Seltzer went back to D.C., he recalculated his degree of whatever he did, and he changed his mind. He said, in fact, Dunning Wilkins does indeed have more than one half Indian blood. And when I read his report, and when I got that picture, and I took it to my granddad, he'd never seen that picture. And I showed it to him, I said, do you remember uh, that white man interviewing you and talking to you and asking you all this stuff? He said, yeah, that damn white man told me I was an Indian. <laughs> he was all worked up, right? And rightfully so. But when I told him, I said, actually, Grandpa, he changed his mind six months later, and he said, you were, you did have more than one half in your blood. My Grandpa said, well, wouldn't you know it? Of course I do. <laughs> he just laughed at that guy. Right? But we are now doing the same thing to ourselves, but instead of using the size of our skulls or the texture of our hair to eliminate people from tribal roles, we give a citizenship test that is biased against anyone who wasn't lucky enough to grow up here and hasn't had opportunity to learn that history. And what do we gain? A sense of exclusivity? That the fewer Lumbees, the more Lumbee those that will remain? In a vain attempt to show that we are bona fide, we are punishing and casting out our own people for fear that we'll let someone in who is not Lumbee enough. We are troubling our own house and will inherit the wind. Or, as Henry Barilari put it Sunday night, the wind will strike back. Right? 
So we better get it together, folks. So how did Native nations get to this place? The formal practice of disenrolling members was first used by Native governments against white people who had acquired tribal citizenship through intermarriage or adoption, right? Especially the tribes in Oklahoma, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole. They adopted lots of white people. Lots of white people were intermarrying with the Indians back then. And in one 1897 U.S. Supreme Court case, the Chickasaw Nation acted to kick out, to disenfranchise a white man who had been adopted as a citizen. The Supreme Court in Roth versus Bernie upheld the right of the Chickasaw to decide who could be a citizen. That was a good case for us, right? We have the right to say a non-Indian is not one of our own. Right? We terminate his adoption. The Cherokee and Osage also disenrolled whites during this era. The first evidence that Shelley and I could find for a native government seeking to disenroll native citizens was until the 1950s, when the Northern Ute uh, did it in a battle over claims fund determination. This is where money kicks in, folks, right? Tribes have, however, at times banished members. Banishment is an ancient concept that has been utilized by societies and states throughout the world dating back at least to 2285 BC. We all know it from studying the Bible or from reading Shakespeare. Indigenous nations rarely used banishment historically, and only then, after all other attempts, ceremonies, public ridicule, restitution, shaming, had been employed to try and restore community harmony. Because it was always about trying to restore the balance, right? And when it was employed, it was used largely for rehabilitation purposes or to protect the community. <coughs> the United States government itself has never engaged in banishment, although it does deport undocumented individuals who are not citizens, and nowadays separates children, too, right, from their parents. Just like it separated so many Native families from our own children in the past, right? We remember that too, don't we? But some states, like Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, and others, allow intrastate banishment. That is, within the state, they can banish individuals within the state, and they're doing it now. And cities like Seattle, Honolulu, Los Angeles, they also banish people, right? They tell homeless people, get out of that park. You can't be there anymore. They tell a lot of poor people where they can be and where they can't be, right? It usually happens with people who don't have economic power. Fifteen states actually have written into their constitutions provisions that forbid the banishment of citizens outside their borders, right? So states know about banishment, right? They don't always like to call it banishment, but they know about it and they do it. Right? The use of banishment and disenrollment can be divided into two broad categories. Non-politically motivated, that is fraud, failure to prove lineal descent, dual membership or error, or politically motivated, vindictiveness, racism, greed, power plays, treason. Our nation, the Lundi, we use the, the term failure to maintain contact, and that can fall into either category, right? depending on who's doing the test, right? Who's doing the test? Native nations have always possessed the inherent authority to denationalize any tribal member. A sovereign government has the power to do things. Right? Moreover, they wield, that is, federally recognized tribes have the power, unknown to any other sovereign in the U.S., to formally exclude non-natives from their territorial homelands. The Navajo Nation has the right to evict me or a white person who lives on the reservation or pass through the reservation. They can close their door. They close their border and not allow any white person on there if they choose to do that. We don't have that power because we're not fully recognized. But very recognized tribes have that power, and it's an important power. Because they North Carolina can't deny you from entering the state, can it? But a tribe can if they choose to do that. But many tribal nations today are engaging in banishment or disenrolled practices in clear violation of their own historic values and principles, which at one time utilized peacemaking mediation, restitution, and compensation to resolve the occasional disputes that arise, right? Communities, we squabble sometimes, right? But we knew how to deal with that historically. But we didn't say, you no longer exist. You are terminated. You are disenrolled. Although 
1968 Indian Civil Rights Act extended to all persons in any country a modified version of the U.S. Bill of Rights. And how many of you knew that Helen Maynard Sherbeck, a prominent Lumbee, she was really the drafter of the Indian Civil Rights Act. She worked for Senator Sam Irvin in the 1960s. She was the, the power behind that important law that imposed portions, elements of the U.S. Constitution of Bill of Rights onto tribal governments. But the only remedy spelled out in that act is the writ of habeas corpus, a fancy term that simply means that if you're locked up in a tribal jail or state or federal jail, you have the right to question whether or not you are legally or illegally being held, right? Habeas corpus has thus far not provided any kind of protection for disenrollees anywhere in the country. Since Native nations are also sovereign, they can and frequently do invoke the doctrine of sovereign immunity, leaving disenfranchised tribal members with virtually no legal recourse. Lumbee disenrollees, because we are not fully fairly recognized, do not have the right to invoke habeas corpus in this context. Our own disenrollees, therefore, have even fewer options than fairly recognized nations. In our <coughs> nation, once you have failed the Lumbee citizenship test, you have to wait how many years to retake it? Three years. Even the driver license bureau cuts you more slack than that, right? <laughs> Dismembered native citizens are also citizens of the states they reside in and have federal citizenship as well. Theoretically, these individuals should be the most protected class of individuals in the country, armed as they are with three distinctive layers of citizenship, right? tribal, state, and federal. But that has not proven to be the case when regards to native citizenship, tribal political elites can and are wielding the power, the absolute power to terminate native citizenship, a power that not even the United States government or state governments can wield over American citizens. Right? The federal government cannot tell you that you're no longer a citizen if you're a citizen. They can't strip that from you. Right? There's no crime that you can commit in this country that, where they'll say you're no longer lucky or no longer a citizen of, of America. Same thing with states. As the U.S. Supreme Court said in an important case in 1967, citizenship is an inviolable right. And while it can be given away, you can voluntarily surrender your, your U.S. citizenship. <coughs> it cannot be taken away, said the court. In other words, involuntary expatriation, that is the stripping of citizenship, is not an available penalty under any state or federal statute. As the court said, quote, in our country, people are sovereign, and the government cannot sever its relationship to the people by taking away their citizenship. That's pretty powerful language right there. So what does it mean, then, that the United States, a very large, heterogeneous, secular state, has in place laws and policies that protect its citizens' rights far more comprehensively than native nations? which, like ours, which are much smaller, more homogeneous, and ostensibly more kin-based, right? Because we're all related to one another. For if native nations are indeed communities of kinfolk that are ancestrally, culturally, psychologically, and territorially related, then it would appear that the ground on which to sever or terminate such a fundamentally organic set of human relationships would have to be unequivocally clear and would in fact rarely be carried out given the grave threat that such actions, the literal depopulation of the community's inhabitants would pose to the existence of the nation. So I'm concerned when I learned that 500 of my kinfolk had been told they were no longer my kinfolk, legally speaking. Right? That should concern every one of us in this room. The very concept of tribal or Lumbee sovereignty means that the people, all of you in this room, the tribal community members themselves are the sovereign. Right? You're the sovereign. You created the government. You're the sovereign. Not the governing bodies of those nations. Tribal councils and other governing institutions have merely been delegated limited authority to fulfill the needs and to protect, not destroy, the rights of the people and should not have the power to sever their relationship to their people by taking away that most important of statuses, 
the status of belonging to, of having citizenship or membership in a native nation and living on the lands of their ancestors. Of course, for many indigenous peoples, the very notion of sovereignty is rooted in their creation accounts and their lands, suggesting that their core identity flows not from human-made constitutions or charters or ordinances, but is directly linked to their ancient origin accounts and the holy beings and sacred lands they are connected to. The issue of our connection to land is a critical dimension. In a conversation I had with an Aborigine scholar from Australia, Christina Black, she said that for native peoples in Australia, there is an implicit understanding that belonging was not just about belonging to a particular group, but also belonging to a particular land, right? Mm -hmm. And to be banished indefinitely from one's own sacred lands had an even more debilitating impact on the mind and spirit of the banished person. So this was something even the offended community knew, that it ultimately did not have the spiritual authority to make a categorical decision on who belongs to country, as the Aborigines say, because all were equally responsible in caring for the homeland, even those who sometimes violated social norms. I think too many of our nations, including our own, Engaging in banishment or disenrollment activities have conveniently forgotten this critical reality. Once alone, always alone. Just last week, the Blackfeet uh, Nation banished a drug dealer. Um, but the chairman, Harry Barnes, said that the person had not been disenrolled. And here's what he said. He said, we've never proposed taking away tribal membership. We can't propose that or would we? Because that's not right. And this is the kicker. He says, you can't take away someone's tribal membership. You can't unblood them. Oh Boom. I love that. Right? This was last week. Why then is legal, political, and cultural termination of a native nation's own kin occurring at such a heightened level now? Are the tribal governmental officials engaged in such harsh decisions acting in a manner that comports with traditional notions of identity? Or are they now acting like privileged and exclusive corporate clubs? What rights do the disenrolled or banished citizens have to contest uh, their being stripped of citizenship? Can Native nations ensure justice and individual civil rights for their citizens and still protect and exercise sovereignty in membership decisions? And finally, what role, if any, should the federal or state government play in these contentious intertribal affairs? Since those dismembered individuals also happen to be U.S. citizens, right? And they've got rights there, too, and rights as state citizens. In our conversation with many natives who've been or who face dismemberment, they emphasize profound concern about the multitude of losses that they have or will sustain. <laughs> They acknowledge and bemoan the important loss of resources, services, and benefits as tribal citizens. But it's when they describe the cultural and the psychic and organic losses that they will suffer by having been forcibly removed from their familiar lands or formally stripped of their citizenship that one feels the full weight <coughs> of how traumatic this membership is. When I got my second cousin to write me last, when he wrote me last year, after he had been disenrolled, he was devastated. He wasn't raised here, but his family is from here. And in Raleigh, he did all he does kind of work for, with the native community up there. And yet none of that seemed to matter when he was told, you no longer exist. But your dad is still a lumpy. Right? That's not right. The fact that an increasing number of tribal leaders, including Lumpy tribal governors, are now engaging in precisely the kind of forced removals or political terminations that many of our own ancestors experience at the hands of federal or state lawmakers is a tragic, tragic reminder that colonized people sometimes become explicit practitioners of the very policies that they themselves once endured, all while maintaining the naive belief that somehow their actions are different than those that were heaped upon their ancestors by whites. Before long, those chance encounters at Linda's or at Fuller's starting with the question, who is your people, will be fewer and farther between. So, let us now move into part two, 
yeah, right, right there. There we go. So now I want to, in part two, move to talk about how other Native peoples determine citizenship or membership. Um, and determining, of course, who belongs in our nation may well be the most important power of our government, of any government for that matter. Although, as I already stated, historically, kinship norms were established and followed uh, much more informally. Uh, in the past, clans, families, and adoption ceremonies were how membership was established. It was never about genetic purity or blood quantum, since no nation was genetically pure. One of the advantages to not being fairly fully fairly recognized is that we are not subject to federal plenary power, which is the power that the federal government claims that it can exercise over every recognized tribe. The power to essentially tell them what they can and can't do. The government can't tell us what we can and can't do, right? And that's a good thing about not being fully recognized, right? Um, and so that gives us, as a tribal nation, a lot of discretionary power over issues like membership, which makes it all the more important for us to do the right thing when it comes to deciding who belongs or who doesn't belong. Now, in terms of the enrollment criteria that's used by other Native peoples, my wife and I have amassed a, a constitutional database of over 500 and 20, I think, Native nations that operate under formal written constitutions. And it's a working database and we can ask all sorts of things of it. And here's what we learned in asking up a question about this issue. Blood quantum is still the most common definitional criteria used by most tribes to determine who belongs in a nation. Over 70% of the, of the more than 570 federally recognized tribes rely upon blood quantum. The most common fraction, one quarter blood. And again, again, how you determine that is anybody's guess, right? Because blood quantum has so many problematic issues to it. The second most common way is lineal descendancy. And we laid that in our constitution, right? If you can trace lineal descent from somebody on one of these base roles, you're lucky, right? And that's good. Uh, and the more and more tribes are slowly moving toward that as becoming the dominant criteria. And some are slowly moving away from blood quantum, although not fully, so they're still struggling with how to do that. At least 100 tribes rely upon lineal descendancy, and another 140 or so rely on parental enrollment. That is, if one of your parents is enrolled, any child of that family is an enrolled member, right? That makes good sense to me, too. The third one is residency, right? Where you live. For some tribes, you have to live within the reservation's territory boundaries, or, or at least make some attempt to live there for a certain period of time, and that also factors into whether or not you are recognized as a citizen. The fourth one is affinity to and knowledge of the tribe's culture. This is the factor that's used more often in Alaska Native communities than Native peoples in the lower 48, because they're largely subsistence-based economies up there, right? It takes everybody to go out and hunt and fish and gather the food stuff that are going to help them survive those harsh winters. And then finally, DNA testing. Um, over 20 tribes now uh, rely upon DNA testing, which also has all sorts of problems associated with it. Um, this is a book that we talked a little bit about yesterday in a meeting that we had with the tribe by Kim Tallbear. She's sister of Wapatan Sioux. And she wrote this book called Native American DNA, uh, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science. <clears throat> and we wrote her last week. We told her we were coming back here. I said, my own tribe is now relying upon some DNA testing. Um, and we want to make sure in our recommendations that we say the right things. And so she helped us to craft a set of recommendations that we're going to get to momentarily about how to do that. But I encourage you to pick up this book. Uh, because she lays out how problematic DNA testing is in certain contexts. And this is the one that I'd like y'all to know about. Um, and what she said, in, basically in her book, is that DNA testing ignores oral history. It is scientifically flawed. It can't determine a tribe's unique characteristics. It can't undo errors on a base role. 
It can't determine percentage of native DNA with absolute certainty. And the tests are not accepted by the BIA as proof of native identity. See? So if we're doing it hoping to prove the BIA that we're a real tribe, we're not helping ourselves, right? So we don't need to go down that road unless we know exactly what we're doing. So that's how other tribes define enrollment. Now I want to talk about how our native people are determining what, who can be disenrolled and how that happens. The most common one, of course, is voluntary relinquishment, right? And that's in our Constitution. If someone decides tomorrow, I no longer want to be a Lumbee, you can stop being a Lumbee. You can approach the tribe and you can contact them and say, I no longer want to be a, a Lumbee. Virtually every tribe has that in their organic laws, too. I don't know that it happens very often, right? Because if you're a native person, there's a lot of pride associated with that. And yet, people acknowledge that sometimes people decide they want to change that, and they have the right to do that. Um, the second most common uh, reason for disenrollment is dual enrollment, which is also in our Constitution. The tribe says you can't belong legally to more than one tribe. Um, there are at least 60 plus tribes, probably more, that have dual enrollment in their constitutions as well. But there are seven nations that don't have any objection to dual enrollment. And, it, and what they say is you can belong to another tribe, but if you do, you won't get benefits from our tribe. Right? That's a compromise. Right? And there's one tribe that says they don't care if you won't belong to another tribe. That's the Osage people. They wrote a new constitution in 2006, and they say, what's the problem having dual membership? I know I have friends who are dual citizens. They're American citizens and they're German citizens, or they're American citizens and they're Swiss citizens. Why is that a problem? Historically, we were all amalgamated. We were all interrelated. That's what we were talking about yesterday, right, Guy? Uh, we know that. So why do we penalize or tell someone that they can't belong when we intermarry at a higher rate than any other ethnic group in the country? 60% of us marry someone other than our own people. And yet we find ways to penalize that. Right? We're not doing ourselves any benefits when we do that, folks. The third most common way uh, rationale for disenrollment is, and there's four different sort of variations of this. Sometimes it's called failure to maintain contact, which is what the Lundy uh, Nation has in our Constitution. Um, and that failure to maintain contact is language that is the exact same language as in two Alaska Native villages as well as the Lundy. The other term that they coin is move if they move away from the village. Right? This is in Alaska. Fifty Alaska Native villages have in their constitution. If you move away, you're no longer considered a citizen of the community. Right? And again, I think that's tied in with economic and subsistence and, and things like that. And very small. Huh? Very small. Very, they're, they're, most of them are very small communities. Sometimes less than a dozen people. Right? Very, very small. But the third language that's connected to that is absence from the reservation. Right? And there are 11 tribes that have that language. And the absence, it varies. Some tribes say if you're away for more than two years, you can be disenrolled. Others say if you've been away for more than five years, you can be disenrolled. One tribe says the Gila River in, in southern Arizona says if you're away for 20 years, you'll be disenrolled. Right? So that varies widely. And then finally, there is a phrase, abandon tribal relations. You abandon tribal relations. The Colville Confederated Tribe in Washington State has that language in their constitution. So that's another uh, category that's used. And then there's the fourth category of uh, rationale for uh, disenrollment the phrase, taken away for good reason. This is up in Alaska, <laughs> exclusively Alaska Native uh, villages. They say the community can decide if they want to take away your citizenship for good reason. And that's very subjective. That's frightening language today. Um, but I want to let you know that it, it is out there. The fifth one is failure to prove lineal descent. That's a very fairly common uh, language that is on the table that I handed out to you. The next one is fraud. Um, Nineteen tribes have in their constitution language that says if they determine that you have committed fraud, you will be disenrolled. But let me have that in our constitution and our ordinance. I understand from the language from the person I communicated with last week in the tribe, there's been only one documented case of fraudulent uh, enrollment in the Lundy Nation. 
in the last 20 years. It's one. So it's not a common phenomenon for any tribe. Right? And yet somehow in the minds of some people, they think it happens all the time. It is not a common phenomenon. And then error, uh, if there's a mistake. Uh, I know that James Jamestown's Cloud in Washington State, they, they claim that there were a family that was enrolled by an error. Uh, and they, they corrected that and they disenrolled the family. I just had to accept the chairman's word on that. I don't know whether that's true or not, but he said that. And a few tribes have that, only four though in their constitutions. The eighth one is misconduct, right? If you misbehave uh, in a certain way, Nine in Alaska have that in their constitution. Um, there's one in California that has language that says, any tribal member who commits a violent felony or act in a willful, malicious manner that might cause damage to the tribe, that individual can be disenrolled. But only a handful of tribes have that language. Typically, misconduct <coughs> usually leads to banishment, which is very different than disenrollment, right? If I banish you, I'll be telling you, Go away. I'm, I'm telling you to physically remove yourself from our lands. But when you're, if, but if you're formally disenrolled, your political identity is terminated. Right? That's a very different process. A ninth one is establishing residence in a foreign country. There are actually two tribes that have that in the Constitution. If you establish residence in a foreign country, you can be disenrolled. And then there's one tribe in California that says if a female member marries a non-Indian, they will be disenrolled. Only happens with the women, not the men. We can marry anybody we want. But if you're a woman, if you belong to the Kachil Dihe band of Winton Indians in California, you will be disenrolled if you marry a non-Indian. Devastating sexism there, right? Just crazy. On the last two categories, if they stop engaging in the fishing industry, where? Alaska, right? Alaska, one village the Heidelberg um, community. And then finally, treason. If you commit treason in two tribes, you can be disenrolled. And we know a family among the Snoqualmie tribe in Washington State, they were banished for having allegedly committed treason. Right? It was all fabricated, politically motivated. They were then reinstated after we fought to get them reinstated, and she later became the tribal chairwoman of the, of the tribe. Right? So, and then, finally, um, I wanted to uh, mention the best language uh, of the tribes that have uh, the strong plan of protecting the rights of their citizens. Um, the Assiniboine Sioux uh, of the Fort, Fort Peck Reservation of Montana, yeah, under their clause, loss of membership, in no case shall a member lose his membership other than by personal request in writing to the tribal executive board or establishing residence in a foreign country. That's pretty strong language. Warm Springs uh, people in Oregon, similar. In no case shall a member lose his membership other than by personal request and writing to the tribal council. Fort Belknap uh, in Montana. In no case shall a member lose his membership other than by personal request and writing to the community council or by reason of his having established residence in a foreign country. Maybe talking about South Dakota. I'm not sure what Fort Cash means, but we, we just don't know, right? They didn't specify. And then more recently, the Spokane people have that language there. Except no question shall be uh, disenrolled, except in instances where a citizen transfers enrollment to another tribe, so again, a dual enrollment. No, Span no Spokane tribal law shall operate to strip citizenship from any person who has previously been recognized to possess citizenship pursuant to Section 1. That's pretty strong, pretty emphatic language. And then I really like what the Duckwater Shoshone Tribal Council says of Nevada. Loss of membership shall be limited exclusively to voluntary relinquishment. The only way you can lose it is to give it up, which is what the United States government says. Right? It can't be taken from you. You have to say, I no longer want it. And you give it up, right? That's freedom of choice, right? Yeah. And then finally, the Kaw Nation of Oklahoma a member may be disenrolled without his consent only, only for fraud in obtaining his enrollment. That's the only reason. So I think those, that's some good language in those uh, provisions that I would encourage the tribe to consider. What time is it? How, how are we doing on time? Four, four, five. 
Until it's over? Ah, gee. Well, that, that's the problem then. Um, what we next have, uh, and there's a language from uh, the Constitution on membership. Go ahead, hon. And there's a language from the Osage. Uh, pretty strong language protecting uh, the rights of members. If you can prove linear descent, uh, you're a member. Uh, and there they say about dual enrollment. It's okay. <laughs> if you belong to the tribe, that's all right. We don't have a problem with that. You're not hurting us. Uh, you may in fact be benefiting us, right? Um, who knows? Um, and then there's a great quote from Byron when he testified on our behalf when we were pursuing recognition in 1988. He was invited by the Lundy tribe to testify uh, in support of our recognition. And that's what he had to say about our people. He really admired how kin-based we were. And he applauded that and said that we were a model for any country. And he saw any country moving further and further away and becoming more and more corporate-like. And he said, that's not who we are. Um, and then what's next? And there we got into the recommendations. And this is where it's a problem because we have four major categories of recommendations. The first one, to standardize and simplify citizenship criteria in accordance with Lumbee history and any country best practices. Um, the second one, to eliminate and avoid potentially discriminatory, unethical, or illegal language and practices. Uh, the third one, to adopt strong rules to protect citizens, civil servants, and the nation. And then finally, to strengthen the Lundy way of life using traditions and historical institutions. Um, so, I don't know quite how to do this because we made some changes to these that I had sent to you, Harv. Um, and we want the people to have access to these. So I'm not sure how to. Yeah, let me stop then. Uh, I wish we had more time to go through these individually because we've laid out what we think are a sensible, reasonable set of recommendations, but they require some changes to the governing documents, which is not an easy process. But having heard what you've heard and when you get a chance to peruse these recommendations, um, we just leave them for the nation to consider. Uh, and as a, as a director chairman, we're certainly open for conversations down the road. So questions, comments, reactions to anything that, um, that I've said? Were you saying a little bit about the plan council you're recommending? Yeah. Well, we were talking about this quite a bit yesterday. Uh, yes? But before you do yeah. that, you have, um, you, it's actually 4 7. So you have another um, 50 minutes. Okay. Oh, that's good. Um, Is there any way we could get copies of, of these, maybe? Why don't, you just, why don't you just read through them? Just read through them? Time. Yeah. Just like you said, just start just answer the question. Okay. Well, we'll just do that. I'll answer that question and we'll just go back and we'll go through it. Yeah. Can I ask a question before we move on? Uh -huh. um, you gave us a statistic of 500 people being disenrolled. Um, when you say disenrolled, do you mean permanently disenrolled? Well, they've been disenrolled, but they can, re they can reapply three years. For enrollment three years. Right. Okay, the other question, then to follow up. Um, the statistic of 500 in comparison to other tribes who were disenrolled, do you have the percentage? Comparison as opposed to numerical because we cannot be compared compared numerically to a tribe in California. Right, right. No, the, the, the California tribe, the Chichansi, there, they had been terminated as a tribe in the 1950s, and then they were reinstated in the 1980s, and they built their role back up to about between 16 and 1800, and then they had some internal fighting between three different families, and once one of a family would become the chair and they take over the leadership of the council, they would kick out 100 folks here, 200 there, 300 there, and within a few years, they had whittled the nation down to less than 1,000. They had disenrolled over 1,000 citizens. So they disenrolled nearly 50% of their tribe? Yeah, slightly more than 50% actually. And, and, and we're, uh, we're doing, I don't know what, 500 out of 60,000. What is the Lumbee's role today officially? 
45,000? 35. 35. Currently enrolled. Oh, currently enrolled 35,000. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, whatever. But that's a lot. The next largest is the Nooksack tribe in Washington State. They have disenrolled, although they're still contesting it, 306 members from their, their nation. Their nation is about 2,000, I think. 350,000 and 2,000. So let me answer Matt's question quickly, and then we'll go back. And we'll just go through these, folks, if, if, if you don't mind. Um, the Glenn Council, we just talked about this, and, and it ties in with the conversation that uh, Harvard chaired a meeting yesterday at the tribe, um, and there were several people there, and the, chair, the, and the council members were there, and Kaya, Frida, um, and Daph, Daph, Darlene, Daniel, Daphne. Daniel, yeah, she was there, several people there. And we're, and we're talking about our identity as a nation, right? Um, and we all understand that we are an amalgamation of, of remnants of several different Native peoples who came here and, and forged a new tribe, a new nation. Uh, and we are now called the Lumbee after having gone through several name changes. Um, usually driven by outside, people say, well, we think you're this, we think you're that. Until we finally say, no, this is who we know that we are, right? Uh, and when you look at the settlement patterns of where people are, the Prospect community, the Union Chapel community, the Rathwell community, um, Sheldon and I were thinking that those communities really, in effect, constitute clans in, in, a, in, a, in a way. Um, I, and we know that the tribe has on the books an elder review committee that for time played a role um, as a unit that disenrollees could go to to contest or challenge their disenrollment. But I understand from the people I talked to in the tribe that that Elder Review Committee no longer meets. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to incorporate uh, the institutions that matter to Lumbees, including the churches and the schools and other uh, social institutions that are prominent among Lumbee. And we just thought that something called or something like what could be called the Lumbee Clan Council could be a body that could be developed that could really help with the cultural revitalization that has already started and is moving forward in a good way. Uh, and who knows what it could, could look like. We just sort of sketched it out as best we could. Um, but you, the people, would know uh, uh, how this would work. But we just think it would be a way to involve elders uh, in a way that is productive and positive, right? Because our elders have a lot of knowledge. Uh, and if we don't tap into that knowledge, it goes away when we lose those individuals, right? Um, and and, a, and a, a clan council like this that could replace that inoperative elder review committee could be a, a body that we think could help really strengthen and fortify uh, the Lumbee way of life, the Lumbee identity uh, as, as a people. So that's just sort of a general uh, idea that, that we had. And, and that it would be modern sort of, sort of after the way we settle and the way the places and the communities that we uh, that we live in uh, in the county. Um, so let's go back to the, the first one. Huh? Um, the first one strengthen, standardize and simplify citizenship criteria in accordance. And there, um, as you can see from that first one, amend the Constitution to base Lumbee citizenship solidly <laughs> and solely on kinship through the use of objective descendancy evidence and eliminate subjective criteria, including failure to maintain contact with blood quantum and unnecessary DNA testing that leaves the nation vulnerable to legal challenges, undermines the value of kinship, are scientifically problematic, and erode trust in government. And we suggest in Article 2, Section 1, delete the clause and who maintain contact with the tribe. B, strike Article 2, Section 2, relating to the establishment and maintenance of contact. Go under the first clause in the articles, uh, in the Constitution and, and the ordinance, it says that you can trace linear descent from anybody on one of base roles, you're a Lumbee. And you are a Lumbee if you can do that. Whether or not you can maintain contact or not should not be a decision left to a body inside the tribal government. Its descendancy is what more and more tribes are moving toward, uh, and it would void lots of uh, problems, lots of problems that. Uh, that the enrollment office has to deal with. As I said, on average, they deal with certifying and recertifying 3,300 cases per year. And I have no idea how much money it takes to do that. But it's a lot of hours. 
try to administer this test, which is very subjective, right? Um, but if based on lean ascendancy, boom, it's done. Uh, you're, you are related to anybody on the base rolls, you're alone being that set. Huh? Your family, your family. If your family, once alone, always alone, that's it. All right? Number two, amend the Constitution to make citizenship permanent. Recognizing, recognizing it as a sacred and worthy of respect. Once alumni, always alumni. Boom. Uh, and then to strengthen that, add language to Article 2 to clarify that those born to alumni parent should acquire citizenship status at birth with the right to retain it in perpetuity forever. B, discontinued membership recertification. <coughs> Once alum, always alum. And C, any citizen who has been enrolled in good faith but is later found to have no biological alumni connection, should still, we believe, retain citizenship. Right. If, if it wasn't their error, if it wasn't done by fraud, they should still be acknowledged as belonging. Right. Number three, amend tribal ordinance to allow disenrollment only in the event of proven fraud, error, or voluntary written, written relinquishment by the individual citizen. The burden of proof and expenses associated with any disenrollment process should be the responsibility of the Lundy government, not the individual Lundy, right? In this country, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? When we put the burden on the person, that is not their burden. The burden is on the government. The citizens are the sovereign, not the government. B, termination of citizenship of any person should not affect the eligibility or citizenship status of the ancestors, living or deceased. Um, descendants or other blood relations. Termination should apply to the person in question and his or her relatives remain as citizens or remain eligible if they would otherwise meet the criteria for citizenship. Excuse me. Yeah. I'm going to get copies of that maybe kind of brought up here. For okay. Me. That would be great. For here. Is there at least 100 here? Probably 100? Um, are you using the term oh. 50? Lumbee Nation and the Lumbee Tribe yeah. of yeah. Interchangeable? Yes, I am. I prefer the term nation because that's a more accurate um, term that we have, were always known as historically. Mm -hmm. Tribe was a pejorative term that the federal government began to use <coughs> 100 years after they dealt with us, trying to minimize our sovereignty. Right. Right? Yeah. Number three, amend tribal ordinances to allow disenrollment. I already went over that. Um, yeah. The burden of proof, B? Yeah. yeah C. On C? C, no tribal law should operate to strip citizenship from anyone who has previously been recognized to possess it. D, if fraud or error is discovered, it should be addressed within one year of enrollment or citizenship will remain permanent thereafter. And E, posthumous disenrollment should not be allowed, ever. If we ever start disenrolling dead individuals, I am really going to lose it. And I will come down here <laughs> and have my way. <laughs> Number four, amend the Constitution to allow for dual enrollment. I just believe that's the way the world is going. When you look at our outmarriage rate, I think if there's no problem in recognizing that, but I respect the tribe's decision on this. If they, I hope they would consider it, uh, and even if they don't allow it e e completely, at least allow it and allow, say, if you want to be enrolled in another tribe, you can do that, but maybe not benefits. That's the tribe's call, but I think dual enrollment is really critical. And five, Strictly limit genetic testing and set professional guidelines for collection and usage. Uh, and I think this is one that we really talked and worked with Kim Paul Bear to make sure that the language was appropriate. Because I'm not a scientist and I don't understand genetics, but she helped us to write this up. Genetic test results in under A should not be conducted by the Lundy Nation. B, genetic testing should not be requested or required by the Lebanese Nation, including retroactive usage for enrollment or disenrollment purposes as outlined in 2 and B to determine blood quantum or to measure degree of genetic authenticity. And C, DNA test results may be utilized only to determine the direct parentage or great grandparentage uh, if the parent is deceased or unavailable of a child if paternity is in question and only if results are submitted for consideration by the applicant or the applicant's parent or guardian. And then under C, that small i, only professionally certified independent results provided by and at the expense of the applicant should be accepted. Mm -hmm. So that's the first major 
set of recommendations. Uh, number two, eliminate and avoid potentially discriminatory, unethical, or illegal language and practices. And first one there, enrollment regulations should be the same for all applicants and meet federal standards of non-discrimination. Under that A, the enrollment and recertification processes include the contact, including the contact test, uh, selection of those to be tested, and methods of testing are based on arbitrary and subjective criteria that leave the nation and the staff performing the task open to legal challenge. We are a lawsuit waiting to happen, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't get our acts together on this. Uh, and when I learned the number of Lumbees and the potential for lawsuits, it, it's frightening because we've been working with this for a number of years, uh, and individuals file lawsuits for quite often, and they step outside the tribe once they've exhausted tribal um, remedies. So we should head that off before it, it, it goes uh, gets out of hand. Number two, prioritize funding so that the budget reflects the needs and values of the Lundy people. Uh, under that, A, eliminate fees gleaned from disenrollment processes currently used to fund the enrollment department as the practice could be viewed as an incentive to disenroll. Among the Chansey people who we interviewed, uh, some of their members who have been disenrolled, they said that for every Chansey who was disenrolled, the tribal council member who was part of that vote received $250. And they added that up. They kept track of how much money they were getting for how many of their citizens they were disenrolling. And that's not, that's not a lone situation. Other tribes do stuff like that too. So we've got to be very careful here. B, a funding currently used to oversee 3,300 enrollment certification or recertifications per year and to facilitate scores of this enrollment should be diverted to other urgent priorities and the staff is reassigned. The current enrollment system is a complicated and expensive process, a solution created to address a problem of the nation's own making. Our people have real pressing needs and rather than disenrolling our kin who might be able to help us build our nation, we should close ranks and engage with federal, state, and tribal governments as one strong nation. We are currently confronted by major issues of historic preservation and environmental review. Scarce resources should be used in those areas to preserve and defend the Lumbee territory and way of life, rather than in an ongoing internal battle over who is more Lumbee. If we burn resources in judging our kinfolk and searching for our identity, we miss opportunities to act and engage as a true nation. Number three, amend the Constitution to eliminate barriers and extend representation to all Lundy citizens, regardless of geographical location. As tribal jurisdiction is claimed over all Lundies, regardless of their geographical location, enable representation for all territory populations by creating an at-large council position. In this way, those living outside Lundy territory, including those serving in the military, would have a meaningful and responsible connection to our nation. And four, strengthen and codify protocols for official public business and private meetings to be broadcast or conducted securely via live streaming, Skype, and other methods so that all citizens will be kept informed about tribal affairs. Citizens unable to travel home or those with health problems or disabilities will thus be able to participate responsibly. And then under that, A, maintain official channels for communications using platforms such as public access channels, YouTube, radio, social media, and podcasts. Why does the Columbia Nation have its own radio station, its own TV station? Why not? We should have that. The Navajo Nation has a radio station, and it's helped their nation expand considerably. Why don't we have our own radio station and TV station? We need that. Number three, number three adopt strong rules to protect citizens, civil servants, and the nation. Number one, citizens or potential citizens should be able to share personal information without fear of discrimination, retaliation, or endangerment. A, ensure strong protocols for providing assistance under special circumstances, such as those protected by restraining orders, people whose movements are curtailed by restraining orders or other legal obligations, citizens who live off territory, those with disabilities, those with severe health concerns. B, sharing of federally protected health or other such sensitive information not directly related to the matter of lineal descendancy should not be required at any juncture in the enrollment process. 
Two, staff, elected officials, and volunteers at every level should be trained in legal standards of confidentiality. A violation of tribal members' confidentiality should carry severe consequences, including professional reprimands and or termination. We've got to protect our citizens' rights profoundly and fundamentally. Three, access to citizens' personal information should be restricted to qualified personnel and secure facilities. A, personal record, person, personal record should be maintained and reviewed in a secure, locked facility with limited access, and the record should not leave Lumpy territory, either by hard copy or electronic methods. And number four, citizenship interviews with citizens or applicants should be conducted only by the nation's trained, designated legal staff. And then the fourth one, we thought about putting this first because it may well be the most important one, but we saved the best for last, we think. <laughs> Strengthen the Lundy way of life. I hear the chairman talk about this all the time, and that's exactly what we are about as people, using traditions and historically important institutions. Number one, using funds currently used to recertify and disenroll, instead create a program, summer program under the direction of the tribal culture and history staff for all territory Lundy youth so that they have the opportunity to learn and appreciate their Lumbee home territory and traditions. Use resources to bring Lumbee relatives home rather than spend money and staff time to lose them forever. Two, and that's the, the Lumbee Plan Council that we talked about earlier. Uh, and that's a lot of reading to do. I'll just let you read through that one. Uh, and give, I, want, I really want you to give that one some thought because I really think that would reconnect us in a profound way with our own natural set of patterns of where Lumbees live today, both here and elsewhere, right? Because we know that we've got our pockets of people in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, in Detroit, other places too, uh, maybe, I don't, I don't know. Greensboro. Greensboro, yeah, exactly. We all know where our, our relatives are at. We have a member living in, at least one member living in all 50 states. All 50 states. And I, and I think there's a way to make sure that their voices get heard too. Just like the ones who live down on Main Street, where my grandma used to live, right? Yeah. So check out number two. Number three, continue the ongoing effort to restore the cultural center, the rec center. While each historic district is centered on its own school and church, the cultural center is our shared gathering place, the ceremonial heart of our nation, no matter where we live. Harry Locklear, where's Harry at? Yeah, yeah. He took Shelly and I around yesterday and drove us all back up in the old golf course and all that. That's a beautiful territory up there. And we know it's become an important place for lots of activities, and we want to see it continue to thrive. And then fourth and finally, and for, to my mind, maybe one of the most important things that we are proposing, amend the Constitution to adopt a Declaration of Rights, a Bill of Rights, recognizing the inherent sovereignty and rights of Lumbee citizens and the natural world. The Declaration of Rights will affirm the sacredness, dignity, and kinship of the Lumbee people, waters, land, air, and other living beings connected to the Lumbee way of life, based on our sacred sense of place. Decisions should be made with our long-term obligations to our land and resources in mind. We will belong here as long as the earth continues, so we must behave in ways that reflect this reality. So. That's what we suggest and offer to you, the people. Thank you very much for your time. Time-wise, um, I don't know where we're at with that. Questions, comments, reactions, suggestions? Yes. I just wanted to point out about the, um, about the number two. There is an organization, it's a nonprofit, um, the, um, that I was wearing my t-shirt today, uh, the, um, the uh, Lundy Tribal Elders Council, mm -hmm. um, and they are, that's the body that okay. does the ceremony out at the, and um, it was started by um, my uncle Raymond Clark, my great uncle. Um, I, I like Raymond, though. Raymond, could you? They want you to, they're, they're recording this, the yeah. you, you microphone. Thank you. Thanks a lot.
Number two, um, there is an organization, it's a um, nonprofit registered in North Carolina called the Lummi Tribal Elders Council. They were, um, they do the ceremony um, at the solstice and the equinox, so four times a year at the um, cultural center. They've been doing that since, I guess, the 80s, maybe. Um, uh, Raymond Clark, a lot of people know him as um, uh, Mr. Pete, who passed away. He was one of the people who kind of re, um, can't think of the right word. But revitalized. Thank you. Revitalized that ceremony. So there's a medicine wheel and other things. And some of the ceremony obviously is pan Indian, but there is definitely a lot that is specific to um, our area. So um, as part of that, I want to say obviously that organization doesn't include all the churches and some of the other. Um, bodies or groups in your suggestion, but people from churches and young um, youth groups, and I know some of the um, the Boys and Girls Club folks and some of the people who work with the tribe with the cultural thing do go to the ceremonies and take part. So there's already that tie-in. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying necessarily that that would be the one body um, that would um, do number two, but that is, you know, an option or something that's out there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. No, very good. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't know about that. See, I've been away from home for a long time, um, and that's good that that's there. I guess I would just say that how does, does, does that recognize or allow all territory Lumbees to participate as well? Yes. You've got to find a way to incorporate. Oh, it does? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. I didn't know that. That's good to know. <laughs> All right. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. All right. I'm yes. Rex, and I'll just say it loudly about the natural world. Yeah. Um, there's a whole movement internationally toward the rights of nature. Right. And can you explain why that is developing and it's developing from the indigenous mm -hmm. perspective? Yeah. But that's exactly right. I mean, it was a movement formally, legally first proposed from a non Indian perspective by uh, a, a law professor in California in the 1970s as part of a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision when his, he wrote a legal brief called Should Trees Have Standing? And he proposed that nature should have the accorded rights. He said corporations have the rights of persons. Ships have rights as persons, and yet a tree does not have any right. Uh, a river has no rights, right? A mountain has no rights. Um, and he never even mentions Native peoples in his article, uh, but Vine Deloria took that article and said, he's saying precisely what, what we've always lived, that the natural world is our organic relative. Uh, and we should always act and behave in ways that reflect that. And that's where I think the chairman's decision to veto um, that decision on the pipeline was just huge and really comports with a movement that is really growing and gaining gain strength throughout any country where Native people are saying, while money is important, there's nothing more important than the quality uh, and the sacredness of water and the lands that we depend upon for everything. Uh, and as Vine always emphasized in many of his writings, the earth is a living being. Uh, and we depend upon her and for all the re re relatives that are connected to the earth. We ourselves are just one set of species that, that are connected to the earth. And so this rights of nature movement really has become a global phenomenon. Um, the Bolivian president, when he was first elected, he was the first indigenous pre state president um, after someone from Mexico some years ago. They changed their constitution around and said, we recognize the rights of nature. Uh, a number of European states have done that. So far, in, among tribes, only two have proposed, have thus far recognized the rights of nature. And I find that stunning and depressing that more native peoples have not recognized the natural world uh, as having rights that we take for granted ourselves as humans. Yeah. 
Have you finished? Yeah, no, I'm finished. Uh, I just wanted to comment to say, I just came back yesterday from the Taking of the Earth Conference in, um, at the Nisqually mm. Reservation. Okay. And this is the topic that was, um, there's many documents shared mm. and the conversation with the indigenous peoples globally, mm. who, and the representatives from the, ma from the map, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the microphone. Uh, but um, just as a brief summary, uh, at the Protecting Mother Earth Conference, the rights of nature was a huge topic. And representatives from the Maori of New Zealand were there who had mm -hmm. declared a river right. having the rights of, um, uh, and, and worked out an agreement with their country mm -hmm. uh, to observe that as well. And they are considered um, co, um, they work together to preserve the rights of the river. So um, I, when I saw that particular one, it is very, very much present in so many of our um, global communities, indigenous global communities, with the effort to uh, preserve Mother Earth. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we can make a strong statement here in the East, here in North Carolina, as being the first Native people in this part of the country to enshrine the rights of nature in our Constitution. Right. Um, that would send a strong message to every other tribe along the Atlantic seaboard and would continue that trend of other nations. But like I said, thus far, only the whole Chunk Nation of Wisconsin and one other one, which one was it? I can't remember. Only two Native people thus far have modified their constitution to enshrine the rights of nature. The we Ponk. should be the third. The, the, Ponk the Ponk? Okay. The Ponk and the whole Chunk. We should be the third. And so I really hope that the tribe will consider doing that. It will send a powerful message to ourselves, to our children, to our neighbors, to our relatives, and to everybody else. Um, I'm, I'm Jonathan Jacobs. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for being here. And thank you for saying stuff that I always wanted to say, but I didn't want to be like a radical, crazy person in the room. <laughs> um, so that, that, I, that had already scientifically proven yeah. in my case. So <laughs> Someone more educated than me said it, so I'm like, you said it, so thank you. Um, uh, it's, I don't want to make it seem like a back any comment towards this university or Old Main because I deeply respect what this university represents and what Old Main represents. Um, but when I walk through Old Main, I'm, I'm both happy and discouraged mm -hmm. that my tribe isn't doing that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, it's worrisome that we have largely relied on other people to research on us and then for everybody else to display it. Um, my thoughts have been in this new resurgence of me discovering who I am. Um, when I drive out to the cultural center, it's it's almost like walking down a a really long aisle to get to the altar of church in a sense. And when I walk through there, you know, and I look around, I, a lot of people see open empty spaces, but in my mind, I see what is what's happening there. It's, it's like. I can't describe it. I see feelings in a sense. There's a certain empathy I have for that place. Mm -hmm. And I personally would love to see something like Old Main at the Culture Center. I think it should be the first thing you see once you pass a better, less chain link style gate. Mm -hmm. Something that we can be proud to walk through. Something that looks less, less prison campus in the center besides that gate. And we see a, a, a place we can go in. We can have an auditorium like this. We can show, you know, newsreels of Julian T. Pierce interviews. And we can so like you know recordings of striking the wind that we still have, and we can have things like this that are recorded. We can show that to visitors, native or non-native alike, to show who we are. What are your thoughts on a building or a repository of information like that? Well, that's that's a great idea. Uh, it really is. I mean, I'm like you when I when we first when my dad retired and moved back home. I was I was I was ninth grade, so I was 13 or 14, and went out to Rex Center for the first time and there at the dance, and it, it really did feel just, it felt fantastic. It really felt like it really was a central hub for the Lumpy people. Um, and then, you know, when I graduated college and moved away, you know, I thought I'd come back as often as I could to visit my relatives and all my, my brothers and my sister. And every time I come back, I always get up there straight away. Cause like, you're right, I just, it just feels good just riding around that loop, right? So when Harry took us around yesterday, out into the golf course, you know, uh, it just felt great. It just feels there's something sacred about that area that is really distinctive. And the more we can do, like you say, and I know that the chairman is committed to continuing to revitalize that and strengthen it, and I and I'm all I applaud that absolutely. 
Good evening. I'm Connie Lockley. I'm the director of the Indian Education Program. And I find this so interesting because I just had a site visit last week from the Office of Indian Education for our Title VI. And one piece that in the past we only had to have a um, birth certificate that showed that the child was American Indian. If it stated on the birth certificate and the child was American Indian, they qualified. With the new legislation that's come out, it now states that we have to have a tribal enrollment number. So that is a big change because we have a lot of students in our county and a lot of parents that don't have tribal enrollment numbers. And we have mentioned this and, and um, in our office and um, talking with, with the chairman about how we can work together to encourage parents to go back and get that tribal enrollment number. It's very important not only for them, but also for their children to receive services from our program. And uh, that was, you know, I, I, when I met with them last week, I said, this is not only going to impact our county, but it's going to impact the entire nation. Because we have children all across the nation. And we had a meeting last year at the NIEA conference, and some of that came out. And um, we have a lot of children. A lot of times, roles are closed, and they may not be able to get that trial enrollment number. So if that child doesn't have that trial enrollment number and doesn't have a 506 form, then they don't qualify for services. Mm -hmm. And that hinders our program and hinders the opportunities we provide for our children. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sierra Locklear. Just wanted to make a comment about in reference to the Lumbee Clan Council. I'm looking forward to the development of that, speaking in reference to our communities. Um, somebody that was raised partially in Union Chapel, then moved to Saddle Tree, then I came over to Red Banks. I feel like I'm living with a good variety of people. <laughs> I mean, I get funny looks. Oh, I don't know those people from Saddle Tree. Okay. So it would be great to see these communities represented by clans leaders or having specific hubs in these communities to further de develop the clan system. So, yeah. Very good. Well, call the clan mother, that'd be fine too. I, whatever you want to do with it. <laughs> well, you do love the clan mothers, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Kay Little Turtle, work with the Lumbee Tribe as a culture enrichment coordinator. Uh, so, right quick, back to the, back to the uh, clan system. I really love the idea of that uh, because you know, I'm one of the kind of people that feel like that we never really lost it, we just kind of renamed it as far as with the kinship system that we had. That's a clan system in itself. But um, to, uh, to kind of get it deeper, so to speak, or, or you know, to kind of traditionally label it this way, I think would be, uh, would be great for our communities, almost like in a sense, whatever community you're born into, per se, that's your clan. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it kind of helps with getting our communities back together and instilling that sense of responsibility. Um, in an indigenous perspective. So I, uh, I'm going to say this right quick. I know that Frank Cooper, our culture education chairperson on the Tribal Council, has mentioned this before. So I would definitely uh, love to, to see the Tribal Council administration um, uh, push this um, and, and get some community feedback. I think this could be great. Uh, another thing, uh, when you mentioned the uh, amalgamation, I know there's been a lot of, of uh, discussion around that and then also some misconceptions mm -hmm. about that. If, if you could maybe uh, just quickly explain that and how that, being an amalgamation of, of, of different things, uh, different uh, remnant tribal members, it doesn't make us uh, less. Uh, and so maybe if you could explain it to everybody, because I think that there's been some misconceptions that we only, we have to link ourselves all to one tribe or, or we're nothing. And so if you could maybe explain it to everybody here, it would help. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yep. We had a meeting yesterday and we were talking about lots of these important issues. Um, I know when I was a young lad getting my degree here, I uh, finished in, here in 76, and when I graduated, I moved up to Raleigh. Danny, Danny Bell and I became roommates and we were roommates for several years. Um, and my first job was working with the Department of Archives and I was hired to do a genealogical study of the coherent people. 
uh, following along the lines of a study that Michelle Long had did when she had been hired by LRDA. She took the 10 most common Lundy surnames and researched them as far back as she could through the documentary records available in the state archives. And I, did, I took the same methodology and did that with the Coherry, uh, trying to sort out where the bells came from, where did the various common um, Coherry surnames come from. And in the course of doing that research, I would take time to research more about Lundy um, uh, ancestry too. Because I'd heard the Tuscarora uh, concept and I, I knew there was a Saponi bit, I knew there was a Shaw bit. Um, and I just wanted to understand because part of me initially was leaning toward finding that one, you know, smoking gun tribe that we could say we all, you know, we all were a part of. But it became very clear, and the more I learned about other Native peoples, is that as Vine Delory, but he's the one who came with that idea that there is no genetically pure tribe anywhere. And he was standing rock Sioux, right? And he was a native as anybody I've ever met in my life. But he knew he wasn't a full blood, he knew he wasn't a pure blood, and it didn't matter one iota. Right? What mattered was his values that he had been born into through his family and what he learned from his grandpa, his dad and his grandpa, grandpa and his grandma and his relatives. Um, and, and so Vine would always emphasize, which is why he was a constant ally of our people. And his aunt, Ella Deloria, right, who spent time here in the 1940s researching our language, right? They say, let me don't have a language. Of course we have a language, right? We have an absolutely unique dialect that is unique in the world. Uh, and there have been books written about it. Lynn Knox and I co-wrote that book, right? Um, and so the more I learned about our diverse history, I, I, I embraced that, and I, I, I relish that, and I welcome that. Because we acquired, in the course of our pursuit of federal recognition, while we've taken on some trappings that are not good for us, like disenrollment, we've also taken on some trappings that are good, which is to gather all the research together and learn our history well, right? And, and the LRDA process and the Lund River Legal Services and all the research that was done, culminating in that ton of research that is available now, all our history is there now. And we just need to write up materials in such a way, produce the curriculum to educate all of our people about our past, right? And it's a beautiful past. It's a diverse past. Uh, but we can identify several native people that we are directly connected to, and we know there is a smattering of other things. Every native people is that, right? Again, there's no pure tribe anywhere that doesn't exist because we've always outmarried, right? We've always done that, and we've always adopted. And occasionally we captured a few people here and there, but we did good, good things, right? <laughs> um, and so that created who we are, and we are unique in the world uh, and I embrace that, and I think our very settlement patterns affirm that dramatically, right? And and Biden always emphasizes that too many too many Native people look at tradition as something historic. And he says, no, tradition is is certainly what we once did, but it's also what you're going to construct for now and in the future, right? Uh, you don't look past, right? You draw from the past, but it's to strengthen you now and to fortify you for the march ahead, right? So we said we should be about the construction of new ceremonies, new concepts, new ideas, new songs. And that's what the tribe is moving toward now, and that's beautiful. And I applaud you for all that good stuff. Are you willing to say which tribe you think we are predominantly from? Well, in the research that I did, uh, it, it came to me, and I read all the research that was available at the time. Uh, we, the Hatteras, the Saponi, and the Shira, for me, are the three major groups. But I learned yesterday in the course of our conversation that there are a couple of other tribes that we are easily connected to as well. But I think once we have some common agreement, we can then begin to develop a cohesive understanding of who we are, and then we just spread the word, right? draw all of our people in, no matter where they live, right? Honolulu, um, Sri Lanka, I don't care. If they are descended from one of those roles, they're lovely. Once a month, all of them. My name is Raisa Jones, and I work in tribal enrollment. And I really appreciate your comments about you know what we were just talking about as far as our tribe, our tribal heritage. Because as Lone people look at us all the time and say, "Well, you know, you're, you're not a heterogeneous tribe, so you're not a tribe at all." And I, I that always confused me because you know people say I'm Lakota Sioux. 
And, you know, I said, well, weren't those two separate peoples that came together for survival reasons? But, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I wanted to speak to, you know, while we talk about um, tr diasporic tribes, which, of course, we are. Right. And the thing that really kind of strikes a chord with me is you know, pride in one's people, you know, pride in one's identity. And, you know, you have people right here, people right down the road, who, for their own reasons, they're not proud to be Lumbee. But then, you know, we have people coming in from, you know, Hawaii and California and, you know, Utah and, you know, even folks who have grown up in other countries come in and they just look, they just look at me and say, you know, when, when people say the word lumpy, you know, my heart just swells with pride. And, you know, we talk about the, um, the issues that our public school systems face because we do have a lot of, you know, parents who they themselves aren't enrolled and their children aren't enrolled. And it's, I feel like that's something that, you know, we should work on as a people to build that pride to the point where, you know, you, you won't be able to wait to get enrolled. You know, you're, you're so proud to be a Lumbee, you're excited. So I feel that measures like that, the, el the elders, you know, council, I think things like that will help build that pride because the issues that we have, the pain that we have our people that are seeking comfort in substance abuse, our people, you know, who were hurting in so many ways, I think that building that pride as a nation of people is going to be what leads to our healing as a people. And I think that, you know, once we heal, then we'll be able to stand tall and start to make these measures that we all dream about happen. So I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to see more of that if we can get more community grassroots programs like that started. I like the stories when, when, when I was young, listening to uh, Granddaddy and different ones talking about the Red Man's Lodge. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. Now, every community in our county, you can go to any Indian community in our county and ask who the community leaders are. Mm -hmm. They're not politicians. They're, they're not people like that. They can point them out. They say, uh, that farmer over there. He's one of the leaders in our community. Mm -hmm. And they, they can point him out to me. Those are the elders. I feel like she be recruited. Right. And, and I love the way the tribe has, has, has went in each community and put, put the tribe building. Now, to me, those are red man's lodges mm -hmm. in, in every community. We're all getting, we're going to get ours out there in chapel eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I just all the time. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm not a rich man. I'm a I'm a big branch here. I'm, I'm from over here, behind the docks. You know? But, um, but, but that, that's what we need to do. We, we, I would like to see a try and really go out in each community and identify the leaders, the true leaders, and invite them, invite them in, invite them into their into their community field. I, I know we, we had the elders group. We, Mama, Mama was part of the elders group. Okay? Right. And, uh, and I, oh my God, I loved it as a pile of when they all got out and danced. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but they need to be identified and buy it in and, uh, and present some, <coughs> some of this to them. You know, and ask them to be a part. See, that's what Vine thought, that's why he thought so highly of our people. It was the informal network uh, of relationships that he knew were, were profoundly uh, important to our people and were distributed widely across the Lumpy community. So even though we, we are an assemblage of remnants of several tribes, there was still a cohesion to our community, see, that he didn't see hardly any other place among all the tribes that he worked with. He said, you love me, you really have it together. 
from a kinship perspective. So it didn't matter to him that we were from three or four or five or six. It did not matter. He knew that our kinship connection extended like the tree's roots and brought us all together, see? And we know that in our hearts, right? Which is why what we've been doing to ourselves in the last 10, 15 years is so fundamentally wrong. And we just know that, right? Uh, but, I, I, but I know that we exposed it now. We're, we're shining some light on it. And I'm, I'm confident we can, we, can, we can straighten it out. Yeah, it was always about trying to trying to, to fit this mold mm -hmm. that someone else created. Right, right. We don't have to do that. Exactly, no. Right. And I would like to add to uh, what one of the ladies in the back said about the enrollment. Uh, I've recently moved back home after being gone for many years. And I have only in the last uh, couple of years been on the enrollment mm -hmm. due to the cause that um, it was it was very um, hectic uh, and um, chaotic trying to get forms fill out for in Mecklenburg County mm -hmm. um, and then once you got them you put them out well okay well the books are closed you can't get registered yet. And I find that that is still some issue at that time. And that may be probably some of the reasons why a lot of people are not registered because the books are closed. On the barriers? Are there barriers to when those books are open? Before? Well, by the Constitution, you have to close the books at certain times, like a month before an election and a month after the election. And then there's a time that they close the updates. That's information I would. We're streaming this. And I know everybody doesn't do Facebook, but we have a website, and Facebook is updated several times a day, and all that information is on there when the uh, roles are open, closed. And that's the thing we're uh, struggling with, is communicating with our people. A lot of the elders, they don't look at Facebook, but they want to see something in print. So we just put out another edition of uh, Swamp, Swamp Stories, and which is telling you what's going on in the tribe. Um, I hope we brought some today. And uh, just that information is always on there. And, and to your point about a television, TV, or radio, I, clearly that's where we need to be so we can mass media out there. So we have, it's not just our four county area, which is Hope, Scotland, Cumberland, and Robinson. We have to touch all the lives now in all 50 states where Lumbees are yeah. to give them information. So now the best way we, that we can do mass media like that, we've chosen is uh, Facebook and uh, our, our website. But let me say another thing about enrollment as far as students. You know, I've been in office almost three years ago, and I campaigned for five or six months before that. So you're talking about 2015. And when I was out of campaigning, this was, really the, this was the number one thing. It was housing, but number one was enrollment. Uh, I got disenrolled. I couldn't pass it. That test, that test, that test. Or um, I. Uh, I'm sick of that mess. I, I tore up my car. I don't, I don't want to be lumpy no more. Uh, I'm disenrolled. I don't want to be in the tribe no more. And to me, especially the millennial group, they couldn't see value in being a enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe. And everything you're saying today is the complete opposite of that. You don't you quit becoming lumpy just because you're not a enrolled Lumbee tribe. There are 60,000 Lumbees who claim Lumbee. There's only 35,000 that's currently enrolled in the tribe. And one of the things I was hearing is you can't see value. What good is it? I mean, I don't need my housework gone. What, what good is it? Well, there's one reason, number one reason right there. You wouldn't believe the calls that we've had this summer. My child is up for a scholarship, and they're not enrolled. That's why every time a Lumbee child is born, they should get a Lumbee enrollment card. It's that important. Because now there's more value to it. Now if you go to the pool, I know it's just a dollar, but you get a discount to go in the pool if you go to the Lumbee card. Eventually we're going to have a welcome center, God willing, beside the turtle. When you come in, we're going to have fresh food from our uh, culture center garden, from other farm of Lumbee farmers, seasonal food. We're going to have all our milk, our stuff, stuff with our name on, with the tribe, with your name on, Lumbee tribe, uh, merchandising center. Then we're going to do other things, but it's going to be a directional. Here's what happened at UNCP. This is Tyler Paramount. This is Culture Center. All these events 
that's going to be a welcome center. And guess what? If you buy gasoline, you're going to get a discount on gasoline because you got your lumpy car. Yes. <laughs> so these are the things that we're working on. And um, it's just so important, that I think, to, to, to me, the most important inherent right of Lumby is being a road member of Lumby tribe. And that's it. And But how do we get there and how do we get this straightened out? That's why I, I asked uh, Dr. Wilkins to come here today. And the things, uh, Ms. Jake, you're talking about the culture center, you know, the museum, things like that. We're cash strapped tribe, so what we're going to have to rely on to get to where you're talking, and that's where we want to go. Thank you for bringing that on. But I do not want to discredit uh, uh, UNC Pembroke and Old Main because our forefathers built this place, and I always show due respect to that. And sometimes we can't do our own archaeology or our own this or our own that. Sometimes we can, but we put the pieces together. But to do the things you're talking about is going to take grants, and we're working on that right now. They're working on three different opioid grants right now. We're actually working on an RFP for Urban Indian Health Center. If we get that, then that's a whole different level of conversation. So maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. But anyway, we're working on these things. But I just felt like uh, this enrollment thing, the, the test, the pressure that uh, the, the staff goes under just to try to administer this, this thing. And then um, what got me the most was this, and I'll end with that. But um, when I saw someone getting disenrolled, they were enrolled. They were enrolled from the time they got their uh, enrollment as a child, and then when they became 18, they had to take the test to re-enroll as an adult. When you took the test, you get disenrolled. That's crazy. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it was even happening, you know? And it took me a while. To, I wasn't ever on the tribal council. Mr. Corbin ever, Ed, Ed, Ed has come to every one of these meetings. He needs to be recognized for that. Everything we have, he comes, he's, and there's Mr. Frank Cooper. This is his area. He's the man that saves us on the council with culture. I mean, it really saves us, trust that. <laughs> but, um, but this is in their hands, too. But when you tell somebody, you're not, we're going to disenroll you from the Lumbee tribe, you're not Lumbee enough to be a Lumbee, and then we're not Indian enough to be recognized as other tribes to be Indian. That's the, that, that's down there and that's from another level. But those are the things that I thought were important, and I think you think they're important because you're here. But here's the bottom line. Now, there's Miss Anita Blanks, the speaker back there. Thank you for coming today. Did I miss anybody from the council? I sure don't want to do that. But thank you for coming, Miss Speaker. But the people have to decide this. People. Not the council as individuals, nor the body, nor the administration, me. The people, you have to tell us what you want. All this, we're going to have to sort through it. We're going to have to have dialogue on this and decide what is the direction we're going to need to go. And then we need to come back to the council and tell them the administration so we can work together and with him and others to decide what is the direction. It's not going to happen next week. You know, the rules are closed right now for new enrollments because of where we had gotten to with this whole process. So we need your help on this. And thank God, thank y'all for being here today. We can't do it without you. Everything is yours. I don't own it. The council doesn't own it. The people own all of this. You own it all. You own $61 million of assets in housing, and community building, and culture center. You own it. You own the pool. You own everything. It's yours. You have to tell us how to manage it. What you want to see done with. What you, how you want to know with people. What is fair for all our lovely people. And the elders. Ever how we're going to work this out? It's them. <coughs> I just came from the elders' lunch today. Dr. Larry, thank you for coming. Some of the others in this room that were the elders that came to this upon an invitation. Uh, thank you. But we can do this, and we can do it together, and it's going to take time. When your enrollments will open back up, I don't know. You know, some people say they want to open up because they want it for the election. I could care less about the election. 
this is about getting things right for the people. You know, get things right for the people. And we got to do it. We got to do it together. And we got to do it with your help. So I want to thank the elders, especially the elders here at the Culture Center. There's the man sitting right there. Stand up, tell him who you are. He's the man. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm the uh, keeper of the far out at the Coastal Center. I've been out for 37 years standing in that place. And I know about the grounds from one end to the other one. And I've been out there when they planted trees, but it seemed like all the trees have been cut out. I don't know if the tribes around the country that planted out there a long time ago. Heard them too. And uh, there's still a few of them, I think, still standing. And But I'm hoping a lot of people would come out to the farm, but they used to have a couple of hundred out there one time, but now just a very few. And I reckon they don't know, want to know about the fire ceremony that in the tribe is all around the world that have a, a fire built in the middle of the tribe. And I do babies out there, or name the babies, attend the babies, and offer the babies to the Creator again, back to the Mother Earth, and give them names and different things like that. And so the uh, Suan language, I speak that a little bit. And uh, that's what I do out in the culture center, keep the far for the people, not me. If it was me, I'd done quit a long time ago, but I'm doing it for the people. For the individual people. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have many leaders in here, especially our uh, female uh, elders leaders, who are doing great things that people don't even, the mass, people, mass of the tribe doesn't even know about sometimes. And that's just like he said, people are in this room and others, a lot of others, do self, selfless acts. Andrew's name me. is Earl Carter. It's the Earl Carter. Yeah, and the end of the language, I'm called Swiss shop. And Swiss shop means I do many things. And there's, I guess, your protege behind you, uh, Mr. Lynn <laughs> Bruce Jacobs. But uh, I think there's a succession that started with Mr. Pete Park, I think, right? So, And there's his great-grandsons that are killed. Them. So we have a lot of traditions in this room, but uh, one thing I did want to do, uh, I know you're a rogue member of the Lumbee Tribe, but thank God, and uh, I just want to ping you with this Lumbee Tribe pen. You're not wearing one, so try not to stick it. That's another thing about the Lumbee Tribe. We're a PhD, lawyered up. We've got professionals in every area, doctored up, and we all have to work together now. Work together with all our knowledge and all our might and all our strength, love, hope, and faith working together to make us a better nation. God bless you and thank you for being here.